Good afternoon, and welcome to the Society of Wetland Scientists March webinar titled Wanted, Invasive Plants, Dead or Alive. My name is Louis Mantini, and I'm going to be your moderator today. I want to offer a special welcome to non-member guests joining us today for our quarterly free webinar. All webinars are complimentary to SWS members, but once a quarter, we open it up to the public, and the next free webinar will be given in July by our 2019 Wetland Ambassador, Priyanka Sakar from Assam University in India, and her mentor, Elizabeth Watson from Drexel University in Philadelphia. Before we get started with the presentation today, I'd like to give our guests a quick overview of what the Society is all about. Foremost is our mission to promote the understanding, conservation, protection, restoration, science-based management, and sustainability of wetlands. For those not familiar, the Society holds monthly English and quarterly Spanish webinars, and the latter are free. The program is also expanding to include wetland interviews, and we expect to hold our first interview in English in the coming weeks, so please stay tuned to this development. Who are we? I'll tell you. Since being founded in 1980, the International Society of Wetland Scientists has grown to more than 3,000 members from more than 60 countries. We have a diverse membership from all sectors of wetland science, including academia, practitioners, consultants, government employees, NGOs, and many students. As one benefit, society members have full access to the Wetlands Journal, Wetlands Science and Practice, and Wetlands Ecology and Management. In addition, Society members enjoy discounted rates for the SWS Professional Certification Program, and there are also excellent networking opportunities listed on this slide. Please visit our website at sws.org to learn more about becoming a member and all of our member benefits. And to support our expanding programs, we have provided an opportunity for sponsorship. We are limiting this to four annual sponsors who will be promoted in our webinars. If you're interested in learning more about sponsorship, please contact our committee member in charge of the program, Roy Massaros, at the email shown on this slide, or email our SWS, SWS office at info at sws.org. We already have two sponsors and proudly introduce them as Water Resources, Hydrology, and Hydraulics Education, which is a nonprofit that shares information on water resources, hydrologic, and hydraulic engineering to help educate and build a better tomorrow. And the Whittington Group, which is a natural resource consulting firm that balances regulatory compliance with sound ecological management. You can find their information at the websites listed on this slide. We have applied to have this webinar approved by the SWS Professional Certification Program for continuing education credits. The credits can be applied to your professional wetland scientist certification or renewal or other certifications. Participation certificates are also available through an automated process, are free to society members and available to non-members for a nominal cost of $20. Certificates are also available for those who watch webinar recordings, which can be found on our past webinars page or our YouTube channel. The latter is complete with multilingual captions. Once approved for credits, attendees receive an email from our SWS Managing Director, Michelle Chosek, about one day after the webinar and are encouraged to check your spam email. If you don't see this email, then please feel free to contact SWS to determine the status of the certi certificates. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. The general format for today's webinar will be a 45-minute presentation by our speakers followed by approximately 15 minutes for questions. At any time during the presentation, you can type your questions into the questions pane of your control panel, and I will pose the questions to our presenters. The, the webinar is being recorded, and you'll receive a link to the recording following the webinar. We also ask that you take a moment to complete the evaluation survey that will help us plan future events. A PDF copy of today's slides can be downloaded from the handout section of the control panel. So with the logistics out of the way, allow me to introduce our presenters, both from the great state of Vermont. 
Karina Daly has over 20 years of experience in environmental consulting, ecological restoration, stream delineation, and wetland assessment and delineation. She currently oversees the environmental department at Trudell Consulting Engineers. Her expertise includes wetlands and water resource policy, forest corridor, and wildlife habitat planning, and expert testimony relevant to Vermont's land use permitting. Prior to joining TCE, Karina worked with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service managing riparian restoration projects, which provided the basis of her master's thesis from Antioch University, New England. Karina's love of nature doesn't end at work. She loves the outdoors, whether on foot, skis, boat, or horseback with family and friends. Zapata Courage has 20 cumulative years of field and laboratory experience in consulting, government, and universities and nonprofits. Since 2014, she has served as a district wetland ecologist with Vermont's Department of Environmental Conservation in wetland regulation, education, restoration, and enforcement. Her prior experiences included working with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Program as a bat biologist and educator. She also worked in the private sector, including natural resource and species surveys. Her favorites were mid-sized carnivore monitoring in the Sierra Madre of California, gray wolf and white-tailed deer trapping and tracking in the boundary waters of Minnesota, tick collecting for parasite biological control in Kenya, raising and reintroducing the white-bearded vulture to Kenya's Hell's Gate National Park, and misnetting bats in Puerto Rico. Zapata earned her BS in conservation biology from the University of Vermont's Rubenstein School of Natural Resources. So, Karina and Zapata, I'd like to turn this presentation over to you. Hello, everybody. This is Karina speaking. First, we wanted to thank you for joining us. We are fortunate that a webinar is the only acceptable means of communicating during this difficult time, and our thoughts are with all communities today across the world. Second, we wanted to provide a background of how we work together. I work as a consulting wetland scientist in Zapata as a state wetland regulator. Welcome to our webinar, Wanted Invasive Plants, Dead or Alive. So what are we looking for? Our presentation will follow this discussion framework. An overview of the most popular Vermont wetland invasives, herbaceous, shrub, and aquatic, and their patterns of establishment within wetlands, their threat to specific wetland functions, a discussion of the different management options for each species, an overview of common monitoring methods and protocols applicable to Vermont, and lastly, we will focus on four wetland restoration projects that incorporate invasive species management into their action plan. And this is Zapata. Thank you for joining us. To begin, we are going to briefly run through the most common invasive wetland plant species occurring within Vermont in the next series of slides. At the end of our presentation, we invite you to share your experiences with the species that are mentioned. So to start with, we have our wetland-specific herbaceous species. Phragmites, or common reed, purple loosestrife, reed canary grass, Japanese knotweed, and yellow iris. Invasive shrubs. The following are the most common invasive shrubs impacting Vermont wetlands. These species typically occur along wetland edges or in marginal wetlands. So everyone knows common honeysuckle. This slide shows European buckthorn on the left and a vigorous ground patch of glossy buckthorn on the right. European alders are known for their sticky buds and dense thickets. In some cases, they have been misidentified for speckled alders planted mistakenly in restored wetlands. Multiflora rose is a painful species. Autumn olive, burning bush or winged spindle bush has corky ridges along the stem, as you can see from the arrow and it grows in shaded closed canopies. Amur maple is a small hardy tree with fragrant flowers. 
And then we have our aquatic invasive plants, which occur within our lakes and ponds, including within the wetlands found in the littoral zone of these water bodies. In Vermont, these wetlands are defined as areas dominated by rooted vegetation, such as lily pads, burries, bulrushes, et cetera. Eurasian milfoil on the left and water chestnut on the right are two plants that are often targeted for management because of their impact on recreational and aesthetic functions of the wetland being compromised. In Vermont, we have seen a pattern. Increased human disturbance results in the introduction of invasive plants, which once established increases the potential to spread locally and to be transported to a new location, whether by human activities or natural processes. In this slide, our monitoring data demonstrates the difference between forest interior and forest edge habitat within a suburban environment. The forest edge is the area of increased human disturbance in the form of human and livestock access and increased light, which favors invasive species establishment. In this case, we had an approximate 86% increase of invasive species presence along the forest edge in comparison to the forest interior. So what are the methods of dispersal? Invasive species introduction and spread can occur both through human disturbance and movement as well as through natural processes. So human disturbance includes activities such as land clearing, you know, through forestry, conversion, mowing, brush hogging. And these activities result in soil disturbance and increased light, light and possible introduction of invasive species. You can also be introducing new soil to a site, the classic clean fill wanted sign. Uh, this can bring along a new seed source for an invasive species to the site. We also have the vehicular boat and transport, literally picking it up and moving it with you, resulting in increased spread, possibly moving it across town and state boundaries or into new water bodies. Even personal gear like hiking boots can be a culprit. Natural processes, wind, wildlife, and water dispersal are needed for pollination and invasive species use the same processes as our native native species. And so this also begs the question of what's on your neighbor's land? Invasive species on adjacent lands can be a source of continued infestation or increased spread onto adjoining parcels over time. And so here in this picture, we can see Phragmites grabbing hold on a patch of disturbed, disturbed bare ground. So why does it matter whether invasive species are establishing within our wetlands? In Vermont, there are 10 functions and values that have been identified as being important to be protected through wetland regulations. Invasive species can negatively impact some of these functions and values, resulting in adverse impact to the specific wetland, but also to the broader landscape, such as our waterways, habitat connectivity, or even human health and safety. Believe me, you don't want to step on a water chestnut. So for example, while this list is not comprehensive, invasive species can compromise the function of erosion control. So shown here on the left, Japanese knotweed doesn't have the persistent root system to hold riverbanks, edges of lakes in place. And the lack of erosion control can have direct impact on water quality. Water quality can be impacted by increased sedimentation or nutrient loads, and the invasive species may also cause indirect social or behavioral effects that could result in water quality impacts. For example, the, the increased use of herbicide use. This could potentially increase the amount that these chemicals enter our water bodies through direct application or runoff. Invasive species also outcompete our rare threatened or endangered species habitat, leading to the demise of the sensitive species in local areas like this Ap Appalachian Jacobs Ladder here in the middle. Invasive species can also compromise wildlife habitat. For example, some invasives do not provide the nutritional value of native plants or they outcompete native vegetation used for specific behaviors such as nesting and feeding as shown in this right hand picture. 
and less understood, there are numerous native plant pollinator or insect relationships which can be eliminated by invasive species colonization. And this loss of native habitat and connection of habitats may have long-term ramifications in planning for climate change. As climate change pushes ranges of native plant populations further north or higher in elevation, connection of natural communities to each other need to be present. Invasive species could create a gap in this connectivity, similar to what we see with forest fragmentation. And lastly, invasive species has a direct impact on our economic and recreational functions of wetlands and our water bodies. Per the EPA, damages by invasive species, plants and animals, is estimated at $138 billion per year. And this includes impacts to forests, fishing, boating, and other outdoor recreation. Monitoring is important. Monitoring is necessary to gauge population presence and management action, but methods can vary drastically by site, species, and established goals. Vermont could probably do a better job standardizing this practice and tracking the data collected. The diagram on the right demonstrates how monitoring is used to detect when management actions are achieving goals and objectives, and when ineffective actions need to be modified. For example, one action could be setting a threshold for invasive treatment. The goal could be to increase the percent native coverage or reduce invasive coverage or 100% eradicate the invasive population. Collecting and documenting baseline data prior to treatment is crucial to tracking change and meeting the established thresholds. A variety of sampling methods are out there and they can differ depending on cover type, but it is important to be consistent. We commonly use one meter quadrats in open herbaceous fields and 10 meter quadrats in the forest or line intersect sampling. Data collection should include stem counts and percent cover for each stratum, as well as photo documentation and GPS location. Timing is everything. Ideally, site visits should occur twice annually at a minimum. Ideally, the site visits should sync with the growing season and prescribed treatment patterns. Reporting is essential, as is establishing a hub to track the spread and store the data. In Vermont, our clearinghouse is vermontinvasives.org. The next few slides will review the variety of ways in which invasive species are managed. Your choice of management methods may be influenced by overall wetland enhancement or more specific goals, personal safety in the case of poison parsnip, to increase wild diversity, or to address the unique needs of species that are rare, threatened, or endangered, or to improve water quality. But before we jump into management methods, we should first try to avoid encouraging invasives in the first place. Therefore, prevention and education are most important to raising awareness. Do we need to log this area? Do we need to bring in soil from another location? Do we need to plant trees from an out-of-state nursery? Shake out your clothes. Are they covered in hitchhikers? Clean your boots, clean your boats, use local firewood only, share your knowledge, and use signs to educate others. So in similar vein to education, one method of control is to isolate and demarcate the invasive species area so that people are made aware of invasive species presence. This will allow them to hopefully take necessary precautions to limit transport and spread, such as a milfoil sign for boaters. Other signage is to try to ensure the area is not disturbed, such as the mo no mow zone up in the right-hand corner. Signage may also be considered the, quote, do nothing approach, where only continued monitoring to ensure no further spread is acceptable. But when we can't avoid them, let's get rid of them. Sometimes the easiest and most fulfilling way is ripping them out by hand. Or weed wrench, a truly satisfying tool. If you haven't ever used one, you should try it. This method is labor intensive and sometimes can be unrealistic or, in fact, or ineffective, as some invasives are stimulated by disturbance. 
Weed mats are typically most effective for small areas or around sensitive zones, such as wells, where chemical solutions are not appropriate. One of the strategies Vermont is using to control the rampant spread of Eurasian milfoil in Lake Fairley is the deployment of bottom barriers. The Lake Fairley Association has approximately 200 sheets of heavy black PVC plastic, which are spread on the bottom of the lake and staked down. The sheets keep the sunlight from reaching the plants, which kills them and prevents new growth. Lake Fairley's permit from the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation allows them to place up to three acres of bottom barrier at a time. Mechanical control for open water on lakes and ponds can mean harvesting machines or diver assisted suction harvesting, also known as DASH. Terrestrial options can include mowing, plowing, weed whacking, chainsaw, tractor, or excavator removal. There are also, of course, chemical control options. Some chemicals have been deemed water safe and can be used within wetlands and water bodies, including Garland 4, Rodeo, and within lakes, Priscilla core specifically targeting milfoil. There are different techniques of application, depending on the species involved, the extent of infestation, location in the landscape, and costs associated with the control method. So these techniques can include spraying, as shown here, cut and drip method, injection, or foliar application known locally as the bloody glove technique. In Vermont, it is important to note that the chemical control must be done by a licensed applicator professional. There are also biological control methods that can be utilized under certain conditions. Basically, letting nature battle nature by having insects, livestock, or fire eat up the invasive plants. Here, we have goats for hire, and in this slide, they're targeting Phragmites. And I personally know of one community in Vermont that used goats to consume the native poison ivy population in the town, so it does work. Consumptions of invasive species can even include us. Yes, did you know that we can eat Japanese knotweed? And this sign is right about its similarity to rhubarb in taste. You should give it a try. So here we have the classic agricultural field wetland dominated by reed canary grass. And as demonstrated by this cartoon, it doesn't provide for much in the way of diversity of plants and food resources in the wetland. This site was selected for wetland restoration where the goal was to restore the agricultural field back to a functional forested floodplain wetland. As part of invasive species control, and especially if there is a specific purpose for the area following treatment, you may want to incorporate an active planting plan following control of an invasive species to help provide for long-term management and or success of the revegetation process. So the photo shows the area after treatment. Based on the map, the dark green areas were planted with saplings. These saplings, once established, and especially as they grow and their crowns become bigger, will shade out the reed canary grass and allow for better long-term management. Without the treatment, it is not uncommon to have planted saplings get choked out by the grass, and consequently, you have a failure of the restoration goals. Some natural succession without planting may also be appropriate if an area is smaller or if there is native seed stock nearby without an adjacent reinfestation source. In reality, the less the land is disturbed, the better. There are factors that should be taken into consideration in developing your invasive or cookbook or site-specific recipe. The next series of slides will walk through each of those factors in detail. So what is your goal? Well, obviously it's to remove the invasive species, but seriously, it is important to identify your goal to allow you for proper planning and its implementation. So in this photo, the wetland occurs on both sides, is dominated by Phragmites, and Phragmites covers acres. 
So is it realistic to think total eradication is possible at this location over that amount of wetland? Probably not. So you do have to ask questions. Is your goal total eradication or simply controlling the spread? Is your goal meant to address and restore a compromised wetland function such as wildlife habitat or recreation? Is your goal to protect an RTE species? And lastly, what is reasonable and practicable? And what is the level of long-term commitment by the landowner or organization that's conducting the work? The questions to ask will also include, the questions to ask is, should also be covered over the next series of slides. Location is huge. Identifying where on the landscape you are, how the site will be accessed, its proximity to open water and sources of reinfestation are important questions. The photo on the left is adjacent a large river and is characterized as open agricultural fields within historic and active floodplains. A major road bisects the project area. While the right hand photo is a remote high elevation pond outflow adjacent state forest land. Relative to location is the type of wetland you are working in. What is its past history of management? What are its hydrologic support, soil characterization, and plant communities? How may have these been altered? The recipe for restoration is dictated by all of these parameters and will certainly vary from an open water marsh to a bog to a seep to a forested swamp. The photo on the left shows a pata in a cattail swamp. But before you get started on method, method of selection, you also need to assess the extent of infestation and the species on site. What is the species or are there multiple invasive species in a given area? How large of an area is impacted? And what is the density of the invasive species occurring there? Is it a monoculture or is it more scattered throughout a site? How long has that species been present and is it continuing to spread? Some species may be better controlled by one method over another. The purple loose stripe in this example on the left can and was controlled by hand pulling, while the buckthorn required chemical control on the same site. In this second example, the density of the buckthorn within a restoration site was determined. Density is divided into low, moderate or high categories. This categorization provides information on the likelihood of needing additional follow-up treatments. High density, as shown by the dark brown and black striped areas on this map, implies a greater than 60% coverage of that invasive species. Typically, that means that this area will require two to three treatments in order to achieve a 90% kill rate success. Another consideration for control selection and method of application is if there are any non-targeted species or rare threatened endangered species concerns. So for an example, the use of a mechanical harvester in a lake or a plow in a wet meadow is indiscriminate and will remove everything. So before you get going, you do need to have a plant inventory to ensure that there will be no negative impacts to other plants occurring in the same area. In this side, in this slide, excuse me, you can see on the right the extent of the wetland as shown by the turquoise area and the corresponding upland area within a solar development project. Within that project, a state sensitive blue eyed grass was identified, shown roughly in the green square survey boxes. On the left, each color within the project area which is defined by this yellow outline, represents eight different invasive species and their related coverage. So in review of your site, you do need to consider to what extent will non-targeted species be impacted. And sometimes this results in a control choice, the use of a specific, specific product, or selecting a specific mode of application in order to limit impact to native vegetation. 
For example, you could consider establishing restrictions or buffers around certain sensitive areas, such as harvesting in a lake in waters that are only at a minimum depth or identifying areas that are dominated by native vegetation and restricting access to those locations. Based on the answers to the site-specific questions, we determine a method or a combination thereof. To increase success of invasive species management, timing is critical. Timing is based on which method is used and the species targeted. This timeline example for Phragmites includes a variety of treatment methods that are dictated by the time within the growing season that they occur and the phenology of the plant. Treatments can take place just as plants begin to grow and are expending energy. This is a good time to knock them back as it requires that they start all over again. Treatment can also occur just before the plants are ready for seed viability and dispersal by hitting them when they have just expended a lot of energy into reproducing. Chemical treatment can be effective in the fall when plants begin to absorb both energy and the chemical into their root systems, thereby increasing its effectiveness to kill the plant. Timing is also about the weather forecast. When did it rain last and when is it forecasted to rain again? And some treatments need to occur before the first frost of the year. If native plantings are to be incorporated, timing is taken into consideration to maximize success and establishment of the newly planted seeds or woody stems, typically early spring, but also early fall. If treatment is planned to occur over multiple seasons or on a rotating schedule, like lake treatments, it is important to follow your timetable to stay equal to or ahead of the species being managed. And then monitoring. A single treatment will rarely result in the eradication of the invasive from the site. As Karina mentioned earlier in the presentation, continued monitoring is a requirement until eradication is confirmed or management goals are attained if success success is to occur. In your success, um, your monitoring will also help drive your response plan because you do have one, right? What are you going to do if weather doesn't cooperate or a natural disaster such as fire or flooding occurs? What happens if a new invasive species arrives on your site or your native plantings fail to establish? You have equipment malfunction, or your contractor is unavailable, or worse, your budget for management is cut. So while monitoring is needed to document the effectiveness of the initial treatment, a response plan is needed for continued treatment or to respond if new species are discovered. So remember, early detection can result, can result in success with quick response. Often, adaptive strategies may be required, so plan for flexibility within a treatment plan or response, and revisit your management goals, and reevaluate if they are realistic. Part of every alternative analysis plan is the, quote, do nothing option, although that may not be the right decision in the long run. So to demonstrate why monitoring in a response plan is needed, I'm going to walk you through an example where the do-nothing approach was devastating. In 2014, a pre-construction pre plant inventory was conducted, and at that time, only one 600-square-foot patch of Phragmites was identified within the wetland buffer zone of the project area. And while the project had a permit, and it was required to treat the Phragmites, they did not treat it. And in 2015, following construction, we saw not only the spread of Phragmites, but we saw four additional new species, each at that time only a single stem identified, including bu glossy buckthorn. We'll come back to that one. For a total of now five invasive species on site. And yes, they still did not treat. In 2016, we went from four species or five species on site to eight species of invasives on site with extensive spread of some. Glossy buckthorn went from a single stem 
to over 500. And you guessed it, they still did not treat. So we're gonna fast forward to 2019. There is now nine species of invasives on site. Glossy buckthorn exploded from one stem to 500 to over 2,500 stems. The developer with an environmental consultant had to create a, a comprehensive management plan and they needed to enact it during the 2019 growing season. So treatment did finally occur in 2019. We're reviewing the results and we're adjusting our control options and our timing of application. Ben and Jerry's? Well, we are in Vermont. What did you expect? While tackling invasive plants on a per site basis may not save the world, it can make a significant difference at the local or regional level. So for the next series of slides, we will introduce you to four different case studies of invasive treatment, Vermont style. We will be focusing on what each case study is evaluating, what the on-site factors might include for consideration, and provide information on what control methods were selected and how the application of those takes place. So sit back with your pint of Ben and Jerry's or your Vermont craft beer and enjoy the green space. This case study focuses on a natural resource conservation service wetland restoration site that manages invasives under the federal WRE program throughout the state of Vermont. In this case, the goal is to restore a dynamic riparian wetland complex that has been in agricultural use for over 100 years and as such has been manipulated by a series of hydrologic modifications, including ditching. Typically, this program includes invasive monitoring to identify invasive species present, size and shape of infestations, other natural features, including rare, threatened, and endangered presence. This info is used to create a plan for their management, either prior to restoration efforts commencing or after initial work is completed. On this site, chemical treatment of reed canary grass may occur as a first step in restoration work to increase survivorship of native trees and shrubs to be planted following treatment. The map shows the identified species, the determined treatment areas, which are based on the density of the infestation that is assessed, as well as notes for how treatment should be carried out. NRCS will generally implement chemical controls with a biannual application of herbicides for buckthorn, alder, reed canary grass, phragmites, and honeysuckle. This spreadsheet is an example of the rhodio glyphosate treatment that was applied for the reed canary grass, alder, buckthorn, phragmites, and honeysuckle from the map location on the previous slide. This included two treatments on a total of 16 acres in 2019. Documentation of what was done and when is important for continued monitoring and response if initial treatments are not successful. Adjustments and timing or a different method or combination may be needed for future treatments if the initial treatment is not effective. We will have an example of this adaptive strategy in our next case study. And our second case study is one that should look familiar from previous slides, back to the solar project. As you know, this site went from a small patch of Phragmites to the site then containing nine different species of inv invasive plants with extensive coverage by about half of them. The concern at this site was not only the explosion of invasives, but also the protection of that sensitive blue-eyed grass. As previously mentioned, no management of invasives were completed for the first four years of the project. Following the plant inventory in 2018, a comprehensive management plan was developed to implement in 2019. This involved reviewing each species identified, as shown in each of these colors, the extent and density of each of those species in its coverage, the proximity of them to the rare, threatened, endangered plant, identification of which methods may be best applicable, and then determining the best timing 
for the application of those selected methods. At this site, a combination of methods were used, mowing, hand pulling, and chemical treatment utilizing two different application techniques, the cut and drip method and a foliar application. So this is what the timing and planning process looked like for 2019 and recognize that monitoring and follow-up treatments are planned for an additional two years with the ability of the state to require additional years if continued management is deemed necessary. So in mid-June of 2019, prior to any mowing taking place, they were able to hand pull the purple loosestrife, Japanese knotweed, and chervil. Then a first mowing occurred on the site, but they went around the Phragmites patches. And the reason for that was because we wanted to utilize the cut and drip method for chemical treatment in the fall. And maintaining a strong stem through the summer enhanced the chemical take up in the fall. Concurrent with and after the, the first mowing occurred, a foliar application of the buckthorn and other woody invasives outside of the array took place to reduce the opportunity for reinfestation inside. And chemical treatment of the woody stems inside the array took place in late fall, coming back to timing, timing that treatment to be most effective. As mentioned, an adaptive management is needed for some sites that may be more complex. In this case, we actually changed the mowing regime from once to twice a growing season in order to use it as a management tool. We had to set a mowing height on the first mow to occur eight inches above the ground to protect the RTE blue-eyed grass, but the second late season mowing could be at ground height and time to occur after herbicide treatment, but with enough time for that treatment to be absorbed. So timing is critical. And if mowing were to occur with disregard to timing and in what is happening with the life cycle of the invasive plants, then mowing could actually be an instrument of spread instead of a management tool. The schoolhouse is a K through 12 private environmentally focused school built in an old dairy barn in South Burlington, Vermont, adjacent a large suburban housing complex. The wet meadow hay fields have been out of ag production since the schoolhouse took over the land, and as a result, the natural wetlands are regenerating. However, as you can see from the map, the site constraints of the schoolhouse and its playground and trails relative to the wetlands have caused some encroachment, and the state required them to come into compliance. You can see the delineated wetland boundary and the Vermont 50-foot jurisdictional buffer the mode walking trails, and the outdoor play spaces right here, and the series of old man-made stock ponds that exist on the site. The compliance plan for the state included approval of a restoration plan, a restoration map, and implementation of a timeline that removed the playground structures, the sandbox, the raised garden beds out of the wetland and buffer, and cease mowing of the wetland walking trails. Native vegetation monitoring was also included with an end goal of three years with 75% native veg establishment. Specific restoration efforts included increased environmental wetland education for the students, including water quality monitoring, annual bio blitz participation, a painted turtle nest monitoring, they nested in the playground sandbox, which was moved, macroinvertebrate sampling within the pond, wetland protection signage and fencing, installation of wildlife passage for the turtles through the playground fence, and planting of native trees and shrubs, installation of some native coarse woody debris within the wetland, and manual removal of invasive honeysuckle. The plan is in its third year of implementation and has had success both from a restoration and education perspective. And this is a photo of Karina standing by an example of one of the signs that would be put up uh, for educational purposes. So our fourth and last case study focuses on removal and prevention of a Eurasian milfoil within Lake Portonia 
a 480 acre lake located in Sudbury, Vermont. Eurasian milk water milfoil was first confirmed in the lake in 1984. The Lake Hortonia Property Owners Association has implemented a number of techniques to manage for Eurasian milfoil so that enjoyment of the lake can continue at the highest level and to help reduce the spread of the species to other water bodies in the region. And so this is includes the chemical control, which is actually controversial smothering techniques, direct removal through hand or diver assisted suctioning, and of course the educational piece, including physical boat inspections and boat owners being met by a greeter at the launching sites. So here on this map, you can see the lake. Red is the Procella core chemical treatment areas. Purple or the magenta color is the diver assisted areas yellow along the shore are bottom barrier deployment zones and green may incorporate both diver assisted suctioning or bottom barriers and the choice will be determined just prior to deployment based on the density of milfoil that season so because treatments are occurring within a body of water which is open to the public the aquatic nuisance in a, or invasive species management within the lakes is regulated through the lakes program with review and approval by the state wetlands program and fish and wildlife staff, including a fisheries biologist and a rare threatened endangered specialist to ensure that appropriate techniques are chosen for treatment in specific areas, that the timing of treatment application, whether it's a bottom barrier or chemical treatment is appropriate and that non-targeted or RTE species and fisheries habitat is protected. So what does a plan look like? So in the fall, they do a, a late season sur survey to document where Eurasian milfoil is, is located. Uh, they collect density information. They create a preliminary plan and submit that to the state for review. In the spring, an early plant survey takes place to recon reconfirm areas of infestation, but also to pick up any both native or invasive species that may not have been evident in the fall and ultimately make final decisions on, where, on which method is appropriate for each area. Now, chemical treatment typically occurs in late June or early July with a follow-up survey and a report on its effectiveness submitted. And this is to document the activities and the results. This process will occur over a series of years as it's important that the entire littoral zone that is treated within a given year is 40% or less in order to protect fisheries habitat. And as previously mentioned, timing is everything. So treatment timing is submitted as part of a management and response plan. And in this case, the caveat in a recognition that the treatment should be delayed until there is sufficient active Eurasian milfoil growth to maximize that herbicide uptake. And then just to remember, chemical control is not always the answer, nor should your option of treatment be limited to such. Many feel like chemicals are the silver bullet, but as you can see, Lake Hortonia is incorporating a variety of control methods and they recognize the important aspect of education. By having volunteers, the local people have a vested interest in the health of their water body and their educational outreach can have a positive impact, not only for their lake, but other waters too. So raising the awareness of the average person can have a long reaching impact. For example, in 2018, over 25,000 watercraft were inspected in Vermont and greeters intercepted and removed over 600 instances of aquatic invasive species, or roughly 79% of recorded intercepts. A large number of these were, were Eurasian milfoil, and so this helps stop the spread and makes boat owners aware of their role in protecting our lakes. The world is a melting pot. What can we do? We certainly can be more careful and observant, be aware of what invasives might be present in a given area, especially if you plan to be working there.
take precautions such as washing off your vehicle, boats, and other equipment before moving it from one place to another, including your wetland boots. Adhere to signage to stop the spread. Educate others. We can spread the word with small facts. For example, buckthorn berries do not provide the nutritional value to birds and wildlife that they need. Become a late greeter and help people remember the importance of washing off their boat. You can even join an invasive species poll. Monitor and manage. Depending on the reason for becoming aware of an invasive species, the level of monitoring and management may change. Recognizing an invasive species in an early stage of infestation can mean the difference in successfully eradicating it. Native seed collection. You can collect native seeds and increase your dispersal by deliberate movement, especially if there are barriers to natural movement. Native plantings. As regulators and consultants, we can ensure the restoration plans include planting plans that incorporate only native species. Natural regeneration and naturalized places. The less chance of disturbance, the less chance of invasive species introduction. If it isn't broken, don't fix it. The best we can do is stay out of an area if possible and allow nature to do what it does best. If working within the regulatory system, review your permits and see if they can incorporate relevant conditions that encourage management and monitoring of invasive species. We need to be thinking about what specific actions we can take to be poised for the future. So at this time, we are finishing our presentation and we would like to thank you for listening to us. I hope we haven't invaded your internet space too much. We want to invite you to ask questions and discuss your experiences with the species mentioned today. What are your successes and failures? Because we really can learn from both. And you can always contact us at our email addresses provided below. Thank you. Someone asked, do goats eat the eat weeds over water? Oh, I don't know the answer to that question, but it's certainly a good one if we could find something to eat that milfoil. Uh, <laughs> the idea? Well, I, I do have actually. I have goats, and they hate wet feet. In fact, they get hoof rot very easily. Maybe a, a water buffalo might work better, but I just uh, <laughs> just thought, you know, perhaps they'll, you know, they will actually, they, they will actually um, venture close to, you know, if there's something they can reach out there and stretch their neck and get that they can't get otherwise, or you know, without having to work for it, then then they'll do it. Um, what is the bloody glove method. It is literally putting the chemical on the glove that the professional is wearing so that they directly wipe it onto the leaves of the targeted plant. It limits the dispersal of that chemical over a larger area. So it's really meant to be targeted application. And the chemical is often red yeah. color, hence bloody glove. <laughs> well, hey, it certainly uh, reduces, reduces the risk for overspray, right? Exactly. Hey. And for some oh, areas where there might be water features or rare threatened or endangered plants that have to be protected, that targeted application may be more applicable. How about, um, how long do you have to do the biannual chemical treatment before you can reduce the treatment frequency? This might be, might have been a targeted question, but if, um, if you think you can tell what the uh, the individuals asking or what you know they're referring to, um, go I, ahead. I think so. Um, and the answer really is it depends. Uh, it comes back to what the management goal is for the site, with what the species is, how it's spread. 
um, size. Look, you know. Yeah, it, it comes back to that that recipe for being site specific. Um, density has a lot to do with it. In that NR, NRCS slide, uh, they will typically plan on if they have a dense patch that they will do no less than two and often three applications. Uh, that's where your monitoring and then your response plan comes into play. Okay. Here's an interesting uh, question. Uh, regarding Phragmites and its uh, capability to, to store carbon, and um, I'll kind of paraphrase this, the question, but is there a benefit to maybe keeping a, an invasive intact? Uh, maybe not letting it you know, get out, maybe, maybe keeping it at a, at a certain level of control so they can function similarly to you know, have any particularly beneficial function. Good question. Or um, is that a bad idea? Well, I think it's it's it, it again. It depends what you're comparing it to. So yes, Phragmites can store carbon, but so can a native forest. And and the diversity in structure and composition of a native forest versus a Phragmites swamp is really different. So the monoculture of Phragmites is much more limiting for many functions than the the native forest so so yes it's doing it's creating one function but we could provide a lot more mm -hmm. okay excellent how how was the survey done in the case of the lake with the eurasian water mill foil so Surveys on lake are done by qualified professionals, and they are literally doing a plant survey um, from a boat and documenting that, um, and obviously identifying where the Eurasian milfoil is occurring and estimation of its density and coverage, uh, because treatment treatment can be expensive and making sure that you're pairing the best treatment uh, for the density that's occurring is important um, as well as identifying sensitive areas where chemical treatment might not be appropriate so these folks go and and do a plant survey uh, trying to get a sense of the overall level of infestation in the fall when your eurasian milfoil would have had all summer to to grow then they go back in the spring and that's important in order to to reconfirm that area of infestation and then really also to pick up any of those non-targeted or rare threatened endangered species that might not have been easily found or evident because of their growing cycle in the fall and at that point is when this final decisions are made about where where the deployments will occur and which method will be selected and that is submitted to the vermont lakes and ponds program who will review it run it by the wetlands program and fish and wildlife and then issue a permit specific to that one year's worth of treatment and that's why it's a, it's on a rotating basis for multiple years when it comes to these open water systems. All right. Uh, here's a good one. Where can you get beetles that consume invasive species? We used to have some beetles here in Vermont. Um, I'm not going to say they fell out of style, but I honestly don't know now where you can get them or get them regionally. Uh, honestly, I would look online, kind of like goats for hire.
Maybe someone else knows the answer to that How one. How about strategy in a municipal? All right. Another question was: uh, Is a good strategy plan to control not with in a municipal key and fairway reconstruction product project? Lewis, can you repeat that again? You're cutting out again. If that um, is a good to control. In a municipal tea and fair project, we think we heard the question. We're going to repeat it. What is a good strategy to treat Japanese knotweed for a municipal project? A fairway area. Um, and that really, again, that, that depends about all of the other site-specific considerations. Uh, how did that material get there? Uh, what, where is it, you know, topographically? Um, what options might be uh, most uh, appropriate? You know, where uh, is it close to uh, houses? Is it close to people's wells? Um, is it an area that you could employ something like a bottom barrier and smother it because nobody's going to be on that area? That's where that site specific and asking those questions really comes into play to help narrow down what, what might be the best option. And, and to add to that, I would say that it has seen a lot of success with knotweed as long as there isn't an, an adjacent seed source nearby. OK. Sent this quiet box, just in case you don't see it or don't hear me. What is your experience with narrow leaf cattail control? To I be, don't have any. <laughs> yeah, to be honest, we I have not yet seen a management control plan submitted for management of that species, primarily because I think there are a lot of challenges to identifying it correctly. Um, we have hybridization occur between narrowleaf and broadleaf. Uh, there's a lot of question as to whether uh, narrowleaf fundamentally changes the system um, because a cattail might be a cattail if it's being used by species for nesting, for example. Um, so we have no actual experience with narrow leaf cattail at all. Okay. Have another for you, um, and I'm going to go ahead and, and post it on the little chat box. Um, how should one apply foliar application with efficiency while trying to prevent the plant to go from seeding by mowing in the same season? So. Um, the one experience that we've got with that is the, the solar project. Um, and it was really looking at the timing of when the mowing was occurring. And the approach was if we mowed it early in the season, so prior to it going to seed, you're knocking it back. It has to exert energy into new growth. It puts out new growth. It puts out new leaves. Uh, in this case, like so glossy buckthorn, for example. Um, it puts out its new growth, new leaves. Then the professional comes in with their bloody gloves and 
you know, touches them all, uh, allows it to be absorbed, uh, kills, starts to kill back the plant. And then in the second mowing, we're mowing it right down to the ground. Um, hopefully, with enough time to have allowed the chemical to fully penetrate the plant. And so knocking it back again uh, with the chemical and then knocking it back one more time with the second mowing so that if any of it wants to try and come back the next spring, it has a big uh, hurdle to overcome to get started again and try to get reestablished. Uh, and the expectation is that we are going to be doing this for two or three or maybe even more years until that cycle of reproduction by the plant is interrupted so much that it cannot no longer survive. Okay. Um, another that. Uh, bring any experience you with parrot's feather in, in wetlands, uh, the individual questioning has had a dilemma with uh, plants breaking off after chemical control. I don't have any experience. The pot, can you speak to that? So I don't have any direct experience with the parrot feather, um, but uh, Eurasian milfoil is capable of spread in the same way where you can have a piece that breaks off and can reestablish elsewhere. Uh, that is actually true of any of the methods utilized in water bodies. Uh, you have to, you do have to be careful about pieces breaking off and depending on the method used, they will also incorporate uh, these like catching mechanisms uh, where they're specifically, while they are, are performing the activity, they're actually catching the pieces uh, to make sure that they can't just float away. Uh, with chemical control, the plant is obviously dying in place. And I don't know how, um, how viable they are at that point when a piece breaks off. Um, we have not, we have not gotten reports back on that necessarily um, as a byproduct, but uh, for Eurasian milfoil. But I don't know how that applies to the the parrot uh, the parrot feather. And That's then to fair. Follow, yeah, to follow okay. up about, um, to follow up about the the milfoil treatment. Uh, a question that came in was, you know, how much or much of the late Cortonia was not treated? And the question was that was because of depth. And yes and yes and no. Uh, depth plays a big part of it because the Eurasian milfoil will not establish past a certain depth and will remain open. Um, so that's that's the big the big aspect. Uh, and then if as as waters get deeper, your control methods become more and more limited uh, just because they may not be able to be effective um, in deeper waters. Good. Um, have another one for you regarding Canada thistle. Is it present in Vermont? Yes, it is. But it's not a wetland plant, so we didn't focus on that one. Okay, all right. But with that said, the same application of a site-specific recipe and then reviewing what, uh, what options for treatment are in order to select the best one that might be appropriate. But as Karina mentioned, Canadian thistle is not a a wetland plant, so we did not touch base on that one. Okay. Um, have a question from North Carolina regarding cattails. Hmm. 
Uh, I think it's similar. So cattails aren't getting that type of concern yet in Vermont. Um, we're still seeing um, that cattails provide substantial significant habitat. Um, the narrow leaf cattail that we spoke to earlier, um, we have we don't have experience controlling that um, because the identification of it is still challenging. Pada, can you elaborate on that? So the question that came in is that um, that down south uh, there's the concern that cattails can can dominate a system, and that in some of the southern states they may actually treat for it. We don't experience that in Vermont. Uh, cattails in general are con considered a native species. We actually have wetlands that are dominated by cattails as a natural system. They, they are recognized as cattail marshes um, and they are providing um, a different habitat component within our landscape. Uh, and such as such, we we actually protect those areas. Um, I think you know across the U.S. and and the difference between North and South, what may not be a nuisance species or an invasive species in Vermont could be considered one in other states. Uh, and you would just simply be using sort of that same site specific recipe um, to to determine how you best want to manage for it. Okay. So Karina Zapata, um, I think you're just starting to get on a roll, <laughs> but um, we're going to have to um, move forward. And I wanna thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to share your expertise. And um, before we sign off, I have a couple of announcements on upcoming Society of Wetland Society events. Um, and our next Spanish webinar will be held on March 25th, presented by Dr. Armando Rivas Hernandez, speaking about the wetlands and wastewater treatment in Mexico. Should be great. As a reminder, all Spanish webinars are offered free of charge to members and non-members. Our next English webinar will be held on April 16th by Jeremy Hsu on the subject of convergence of wetland, tech, wetland science and technology. And finally, please be sure to subscribe to our, to subscribe or follow our society's social media channels like Facebook and LinkedIn to keep informed and to support the society. We also have a YouTube channel where all webinars are posted three months after their original broadcast with multilingual subtitles. If you are Spanish speaking, be sure to subscribe to the Latin American and Caribbean regions Facebook page at the link listed here. And thanks again. Karina Zabata, and thank you to our audience for participating today and your patience as well. Have a wonderful and safe day. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Thank you.